When I, when I began to prepare for this talk, I, I looked at the outline that I'd sent to Alan. Uh, well, just the title alone, and I thought, my goodness, that's going to involve some heavy lifting. We've got enough there to keep a national commission going for several years. But it's so timely now, when you hear this, uh, for the first time ever in Canadian history, we have culture on the agenda for the federal election campaign. One of the, one of the ten key topics that are being discussed. It's about time, frankly. I looked at this title and I thought, who am I be to be doing the preaching, you know? Um, I'm not a professional prognosticator. I hold no special key to the future. Although, I in my part-time acting career, uh, I did have a role on the X-Files uh, as an academic who specializes in the influence of alien life forms on human society. I was trying to persuade Mulder that aliens exist. So I do know the truth is out there. <laughs> what, I, what I am is someone who writes about culture. And, um, and what writers tend to do, my sort of writer anyway, is, is synthesize um, information and speculate on where that might take us. Try to make sense of it all. So I want to start by telling you a little story. A little story about Amy, six years old. Amy's in art class at school, drawing away. And the teacher's going around behind all the kids, as the teachers do, looking over their shoulders, seeing what they're drawing. And she comes up behind Amy and says, oh, Amy, that's interesting. What are you drawing? And Amy says, I'm drawing God. And the teacher says, well, Amy, you know, no one knows what God looks like. And Amy says, no, but they will in a minute. <laughs> it's a lovely story. Um, I told that story to Gordon Campbell. And, and he said, yes, th that's true. Kids like that have tremendous imagination. The problem is... Um, by the time they're six or so, we've knocked it out of them. They're being programmed to learn in a different way. Imagination takes second place to knowledge. And that's true, you know, but it's also too bad because imagination really is key to everything we hope for. Um, the key, perhaps, to our, our future happiness as individuals, as a society, and as, as a race. In times of crisis, said Albert Einstein, only imagination is more important than knowledge. And we, believe, we live, I think, in a time of crisis. It's never been more important for humanity to be able to bring the force of its imagination to bear on the challenges that confront us. Uh, in the next few minutes, I'll try to explain why I believe this is so, why I believe the answer lies in a radically new approach to education, and why I believe it's necessary for us to develop a worldwide network of advocacy to ensure that new, this new approach is made possible. I'm a writer, as I said. I spent my life writing about the arts. I'm a former member of the board of the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, which is the pri prime funding body for professional activity in the arts in this country. And I served four years as president of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. And if I've learned anything in those years, it's that Education systems in many parts of the world shortchange, badly shortchanged, and have for decades shortchanged our young people and ourselves in the area of, of imaginative skills. We live, unfortunately, in an age where, while a lot of lip service is paid to the need to foster the imagination, little has been done to make that a reality in the education system. What's been given priority instead? is equipping young people with the skills that will let them navigate through the modern world. Literacy, numeracy, the basics we need to function in an organized society. They are basics and we need them. Those skills are absolutely necessary, but we continue to neglect the imagination at our peril. We live in a world of really fundamental change. We long ago left behind the agrarian age. Uh, and the industrial age. We moved from there over the, over the centuries, but sp we're speeding up our movement. Agrarian age lasted for many hundreds of years. Industrial age didn't last so long. Uh, most people now acknowledge that the new cyber te technologies led us to the information or the knowledge society. And that hasn't been an easy process for many societies. We're, we're still deep in the debates that have ar arisen around the whole question of use of technology and, and knowledge and, and information. But even, if, even as we get engaged in those debates, and they're really complicated ones, 
uh, we're moving on. Beyond the information knowledge economy and into the economy of the age of the imagination. The age of the imagination. It's an age in which the resources of the mind are becoming as important as the resources of the earth, as the basis of economic prosperity. We're moving that way, he, even here in BC, which is, has an economy that's been based for, for decades and decades and decades on, on resources, on, on extraction. We're finding more and more that the resources of the imagination, of the mind, are where we're going to find our future. Clearly, it, it's time, it's beyond time, to relocate creative activity and expressive engagement at the heart of the social agenda, with an imagination-based imagination education as the touchstone. Because the liberated imagination, particularly the liberated imaginative activity that comes when you get engaged with cultural expression, is absolutely necessary to the achievement of all we hope for as a society. What, what do we hope for as a society? Certainly we, we made a spectacular mess of the world at this point. The issue right now, of course, front and centre in our thinking, is the world economic meltdown. It's a horrendous challenge. But that's probably more fixable than some of the other issues that confront us. Population growth is out of control, which brings with it a host of basic problems that we're managing badly. Poverty, the lack of clean water, an inadequate food supply, pollution, Organized crime and the drug economy are rampant worldwide. The divide between have and have not societies is widening and not narrowing as we thought it would with the new access to information and imagination that we thought would be a great leveler. We've got only the weakest grip on, on global health threats. We're often unable to protect human rights. We're nowhere near coming to terms with the effects of climate change. And as far as developing any kind of understanding among the world's peoples, We'd, we're, we're, we would be laughably far from success if it wasn't such a tragedy. Terrorism challenges the whole notion of peaceful coexistence among the nations of the world. And meanwhile, the advances that are occurring in, in scientific research, robotics, stem cells, the human genome, cloning, nanotechnology, the promise of extended life, they cause as much concern as celebration. Even science is no longer the rigid indicator of truth that we once thought it was. How do we ensure that science advances in step with ethical principles and a clear human conscience? How do we replace the solutions of short-term expediency with, with a vision of long-term change? The challenges of the, of the modern age call for a new breed of individual, one who can be relied on to use a full range of the imagination and the intellect to bridge the gap between the material and the non-material, between scientific reality and the intuitive world of what might be, and to come to terms with these enormous challenges we've created for ourselves and our eagerness to take advantage of these new technologies. It's that bridge that between the real and the imagined that Northrop Fry talked about, that the arts, creative engagement can build that bridge. We, we move from reality to intuition, we intuit change, we intuit solutions. Secular democracy, pluralism, human rights, they all became the backbone of the society we built in the last 200 years because they were needed to make a modern state efficient and economically stable. Now we need to expand on that basis to include the rights of the liberated mind, the right to imagine, the right to challenge, the right to think in a new way, freedom to the right brain, the right to think in terms of our shared humanity. Uh, it was put very aptly in, in our creative diver diversity, which was the report on the UNESCO World Commission on Culture and Development. It said, the notion of creativity must be broadly used, not just to refer to the production of a new object or form, but to problem solving in every imaginable field. And we've got to make that quite clear. Creativity isn't just limited to the arts and culture, it's across the board. And we have to foster that everywhere. The, the great Philosopher Mary Warnock um, said the same thing uh, in 1976 in her book Imagination. The cultivation of the imagination should be the chief role of education. 
I, I think you know, few of us would disagree that, that the arts and, and culture, uh, cultural activities, cultural expression, cultural exchange, bring aesthetic pleasure and, and gaiety to our lives. And we must never forget the essence of absolute joy, uh, unqualified by any reason other than exist this existence that we get from engaging with, with, with creative expression. But they also have other less evident values for the individual and for society. There's been some very interesting scientific research in the last 10, 20 years about this. Engagement with the arts synthesizes the rational and the emotional, the imaginative and the intuitive. Howard Gardner at Harvard argues that we have multiple intelligences, linguistic, logical, mathematical, musical, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, interpersonal, all these intelligences that we don't get used or exercised in a basic school curriculum. Only a few of them come into play. Two out of this lot really get involved in school. Artistic activity, creative activity, helps students conceptualize, solve problems, work with others, improves creativity, discernment, originality, resistance to closure. If you're working on a play or a piece of music, you know you can't just close down your mind and do it your way. You've got to work with other people. It teaches, teaches a very interesting lesson in terms of finding consensus, of working with others, being resistant to coaching, keeping alive, ideas alive, creating supple minds. And we're coming to un understand much better the way that arts and creative expression promote behavioral development in young people, contribute to better health, reduce health care costs, and build economic prosperity. Engagement with cultural expression strengthens the creative process. It encourages social harmony. You get people together in a, in a, in a, on a, street, a street party or a street fair. Uh, you show people how you express yourself through the arts. And it, you get to know your neighbors better. And there's a little bit less likelihood that there'll be another 7-Eleven. 9-Eleven. Um, it's, it's through fostering the process of, of, of learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, and learning to live together. And that develops individuals of, of confidence, imagination, and transformative vision. And it challenges us to see the world in, in fresh ways and gives us the, that all-important resilience we need in modern society. If, 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 we're going to, if, if the human race is going to respond to this astonishing range of challenges and opportunities that I just listed. Yes, of course, we need food and clothing and consumer goods, all the trappings of the everyday business of living in groups in order to survive and thrive in a material way. But the area of the intangible, the imagined interior world of dreams is where we discover not only, not only what new things we might make and new things we might do, but who we are and what we might become. And it follows, to my mind, logically, that we should give ourselves full access to the inspirational and educational influence of involvement with creative expression as a central part of our lives, not as a peripheral one in the schools, before the schools, after the schools. Some might even say that the fostering of creativity and imaginative activity in our education systems is the only sure way of moving our societies from competitive to collaborative, from economic and military confrontation to a true dialogue of cultures on which peaceful and harmonious development can be built. Many studies have shown how exposure to the arts and imaginative education that incorporates creative activity into the learning process, that is learning through the arts, uh, as well as about the arts, uh, you know the difference, I mean, it's quite clear. You, you can go to school and learn the history of art, um, and that's one way of learning, but, but when you learn through the arts, using them as a tool for learning, it's a different way, and it, it really helps to achieve a wider range of learning goals and, and seeds of the development of, of involved and, and creative citizens. I, I was in Tucson, Arizona, a couple of years ago. They're doing a really interesting study there. At five years, they've taken five grades of the Tucson schools, and um, this experiment is called Opening Minds Through the Arts. Every class in every grade, whatever the class is, geography, physics, whatever, 
gets a teacher and an artist. So you learn through creative engagement. You don't learn through rote. You learn through your imagination. And they, the, the, the results are astonishing. After the first three years, 25% um, better, those kids, in literacy and numeracy than in the, in the basics than kids in the control schools. It, it works. Um, a young person who's exposed to the arts in school has an enhanced potential to become a more creative, imaginative, empathetic, expressive, confident, self-reliant, critically thinking human being. They get involved there, things like this, and they are transformed. They become different people, fuller people, more enriched people, more confident people. Kieran Egan, the uh, Simon Fraser education professor, whose theories form the basis of the work of the Imaginative, Imaginative Education Research Group at Simon Fraser, argues that attention to the imagination is a better means to achieve the ends desired by those who currently direct public schooling and that the sidelined and neglected frill is actually the most effective tool we have for efficient and effective learning. He's a very interesting guy. He, um, he's influencing a great deal of um, education thinking around the world these days. Uh, right out of Simon Fraser, they have a, a really ex interesting experimental group that's working on these theories of, of engaging the imagination, learning through the imagination, not just through the arts, but uh, engaging the imagination generally of young people and totally, just totally blowing up the education system and approaching learning a different way. Yesterday, the, the Board of Trade here in Vancouver held a breakfast session featuring, no, Thursday, featuring Richard Florida as, as guest speaker. You probably know about Richard Florida, do you? He's a, an American urban theorist who, who shook the entire world of, of urban and social planning uh, five or six years ago with a book called The Rise of the Creative Class. Um, his basic theory is that cities and uh, regions thrive economically in response to how welcoming they are to creative individuals. That's 30-35% that's of the workforce. It's artists and choreographers and painters, architects, planners, people who create. And he says if you make your community, your city, attractive to them, they will come to you and the companies that need that, the, those as resources will come to you as well and you, you grow your economy. It makes good sense. And in the question period on Thursday, someone asked him about education. And he made a gesture of despair and he said, yes, we need to blow up the system. That's Richard Florida. I, I couldn't agree more with him. In fact, I'd argue that the need to reintroduce the experience of creative activity at all stages of learning, that's right throughout life, to build a system that enables and encourages the imagination to flourish everywhere has never been more pressing. Uh, we had a, a, a province-wide arts summit a couple of years ago in, in British Columbia, and, and one participant summed it up like this. If we do not provide an arts-enriched education, we're denying not only our youth the joy and fulfillment that a passion for the arts can bring, we're robbing society of an essential, creative, driving force. Now, th these benefits are, are, are widely understood within the education community, uh, but a number of significant challenges, among them the conflicting demands for the basics education, um, the difficulties that you find in trying to standardize the measurement of imaginative activity. How do you measure imagination? It's very difficult for educators. These things get in the way of significant curriculum change, and teachers are frightened too. A lot of them, there are some wonderful wonderful leaders in the education field are doing these things, but for a lot of teachers it's, they're very reluctant because you can't quantify it yet, although there's some interesting studies going on in terms of how we can, well, how we can measure creativity, uh, because we, we're working in a, inside a system that relies on standards and grades, uh, education. Um, so how do, you, how do you fit this new idea into that? Uh, it's coming, um, but there's still no systematized approach to learning uh, to teaching this stuff that yet exists anywhere in the world. And to, to complicate the situation some more, the whole notion of education through the arts is still imperfectly understood. Educators are reluctant to take on the task of teaching subjects or, or teaching in ways for which they've not been adequately prepared. And I don't blame them. Um, you want to do a job well. And in a system, depending on grading, as I say, there's an understandable, understandable resistance 
just taking on something that's difficult to measure is creativity. So, where do we go from here? Well, as it happens, a great deal of attention is being given to this question at both the national and international level. Uh, I mentioned earlier my involvement with UNESCO. Uh, and one of the files I, I took a special interest in over those years, over all these years with UNESCO, has been, that's UNESCO in Paris, that's me at the UNESCO table, representing Canada at UNESCO in Paris. Um, one of the files I, I took a special interest in all through these years has been arts education. And in 2006, uh, UNESCO held a world conference on arts education in, in Lisbon. That conference was the result of several years of preparatory conferences, that's the way UNESCO works, around the world, which scope out the scale of the problem. And out of, it, out of this came what we call a roadmap for arts education, affirming that education in and through the arts stimulates cognitive development and can make learning more relevant to the needs of modern societies and reinforcing the notion of the importance of imagination to the new global economy. One of the spin-offs from that conference was uh, something called the World Alliance for Arts Education. It's an amalgam of professional education organizations um, that's attempted to evolve and, art and articulate a totally renewed vision for the field. The Alliance has set up what it calls a World Creativity Summit and has already held two major sessions, one in Hong Kong last year, one in Taipei this year, to hammer out an action plan to bring all this idealism to reality. And what we've identified at those summits is a framework of actions that we can undertake alongside the UNESCO initiative uh, under three broad general headings. The priorities we see for that we can work on are, are networking, which means building connections and exchanging information on a global basis. Research, providing the tools of proof that are so necessary to persuade the uncommitted and the, and the people who control the money, and advocacy. And meanwhile, here in Canada, we've been building a, a, a steadily building an alliance of our own, bringing together a wide variety of interested parties, government, business, educators, funders, to advance the same aims. We have a national symposium on the topic in Kingston in a couple of weeks' time. And the Global Alliance holds its third world summit in the Middle East next year. And it's all leading up to uh, 2010, when we can reconvene uh, in Seoul, Korea, for a five-year follow-up to the UNESCO World Conference and try to put all these ideas into real action. So clearly, things are happening. We can't mandate the magical appearance of creative individuals, but we can certainly provide the climate in which that they have the possibility of emerging. We can provide a system where it's not crushed out of them, where they're not consigned to the fringes of the system and made to learn just the basics. To do that, though, we have to have a wholesale change of public and political will. And that means sustained and serious advocacy. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a writer, I try to put, word, put ideas out, so advocacy has been the area in which I've become particularly involved. I chaired the advocacy group in, in Taipei. I'll be working with that group over the next two years leading up to, to Seoul. And I'm doing a similar thing with the Canadian initiative. And the challenge of advocacy, advocacy for this field can really be expressed in a series of questions. What might be useful ways to create a coalition of the willing, to get people to see that they need to band together to make this happen? What might the message of that campaign be? How can it be encapsulated in a manner that's succinct enough for, for broad general consumption, but nuanced enough not to betray the, the purposes of this initiative, not to make it too coarse to, to stand up? How do we develop the public and political will to take full advantage of these enormous potential benefits? Well, it's increasingly realized that teachers, artists, parents, and students themselves have a significant role to play in promoting arts and learning, both within our schools and within community-based educational programs. But for the sector to have any chance of achieving these transformative aims, of embedding it in the way we work, 
but it's necessary to reframe the arguments in a way that will give it broader general appeal to politicians, to bureaucrats, to educators, and most specifically to the public at large. Because it's an inescapable fact that by no means everyone recognises and understands the importance of a transformed global education system that positions arts and culture firmly at its heart. Uh, I, the no this notion of, of fostering the imagination, of, of releasing the right brain to provide us with the solutions to these great challenges we're facing, uh, it's not widely understood yet. We have to get that message out. And if we're to have any hope of advancing this cause, we have to devise and activate a multifaceted campaign to win friends in high places and influence people in all walks of life, to lodge the importance of what we're seeking at the heart of the public agenda. And we have to do this in a way that will build public understanding and public goodwill. Because without understanding and support at every level of society, we won't build political will. And without political will, we'll make no progress. It's clear that, that humankind does have a tremendous capacity for embracing change. We've seen that in recent decades in the change in public attitudes to the environment. It's a change that has come about not merely by the imparting of knowledge. Global warming means sea levels will rise. Okay, that's knowledge. But by the development of understanding and the value of, value of wisdom, uh, we'll interpret that knowledge in ways that will en enable us to make the necessary changes to the way we live. W once we understood the whales, we treated them differently. In fact, the environmental movement is an area that cultural activists education activists might usefully study. We also have to recognise, and this is something that uh, people seem to be having trouble getting hold of, the world is changing around us, not least the means through which we communicate. If we want to raise you know, the internet, if we want to raise public awareness and through that stimulate political action, we're going to have to, have, have to add the new technology as a prime tool in the arsenal of persuasion. Because the online world is creating not only a new forum for discussion, but a new form of discussion. An interchange of thoughts and ideas where everyone feeds off everyone else. Uh, you know, there are 75,000 75, blogs an hour are posted to the internet. You sift through those and you get a little bit of an idea here and a bit of an idea there and you piece it together. It's a different form of of, communi of communicating, a different form of exchange. Everyone feeds off everyone else. A kind of ongoing collective reflection on life. And it's something quite new in human experience to have that immediately accessible. I mean, it's impossible to deal with 75,000 blogs an hour. You can't read them all. Um, so we begin to rely on our friends who will say, well, here's an interesting one. Or the blog filter machines who say, we've, we're going to filter out the really interesting stuff. And they th do it by topic. It's, it's, we're getting whole new approaches to things, and it's all happening as we speak. The internet and our communication systems are magnifying, it's growing, developing, it's fresh, it's new, and it's something that's still evolving. These new uses of technology, I think, have to become a prime tool in any campaign for advocacy for the same kind of things I'm talking about. They have to distribute the stories and the arguments via blogs, webcasts, discussion groups, other forms of networking, because we all know that ideas spread faster than epi epidemics on, on the net. So we need a serious campaign to infect public thinking with the virus of curriculum change. To support that, we have to have, as I, as you, as I said earlier on, a, a stockpile of, of research material and analysis, hard research that will buttress the passionate assertion that's heard so often in this field. The evidence is all around us in, in, in many countries. Inspired, imaginative teachers are embedding creative learning into the curriculum with greater or, or lesser degrees of complicity from their masters. And the results are incontrovertible. It works. We have to show the world how. <coughs> what will materially influence the success of any sustained campaign to enlist public support will be the partnerships that are created. The sector doesn't exist in isolation. Nothing these days exists in isolation. And it'll be vital to establish partnerships across many other sectors, health, 
social justice, multiculturalism, immigration, is, and, and in a holistic way. It's got to be embracing. It's got to be embracing. Connections have to be established among ministries in government, across different levels of government, federal, provincial, local, and with business, education, and special interest agencies of all stripes. And in the same way, it'll be vital to demonstrate individual value. Successful campaigns for social change have succeeded because they have shown personal benefits. It's, it's what it does for me. Uh, we can talk all we like about the benefits to society, but it's what it does for me that makes a change. Um, Anti-smoking um, campaigns. I was a teenage tobacco chewing zombie. Phlegm balls. Um, the anti-smoking campaigns that were most successful are the ones that pointed out to you what was going to be bad for you. It works every way. Do you remember participation? Um, the, uh, the, where we were all supposed to look like 60-year-old Swedes? Well, we weren't, not younger. Um, that worked because it appealed to the individual. Uh, what am, what's in it for me? We have to realize that we're all trying to improve the way we live. We're all trying to make our lives more significant, more resonant, more filled with, 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 with import. And, and when you pitch a campaign to someone to, to change their ways, it has to show a benefit to them. And I think a similar campaign has to apply in any sustained campaign for culture and cultural edu arts education. Uh, because while it might deliver, uh, like the smoking campaign, anti-smoking campaign, serious social benefits, it'll stand or fall on its value for the individual. The key will be to embrace rather than to exclude. You've got to bring people in, let them know that this stuff is worth doing, worth having, can transform our lives, and can transform our world. Let people know that they don't need a code to get through the door. It's like art, generally. People think, oh, I don't really understand art, so I'm really excluded. Well, and then you get people like Harper talking about elitism. It drives me crazy. Uh, the only elitists are the ones who say, that's not for me, as if, you know, uh, I don't want to get involved with that. It's for everyone. There is no golden key because the, the cathedral's open and you, anyone can go in. It, it's a door that should be open to anyone who wants to be part of this great adventure of education through cultural activity, creative expression, creative engagement. And you have to leave that door open in a, in a, a new generosity of spirit that recognizes that a multiplicity of partners working together can create great and noble things. I think I believe that this transformation of the, of the educational curriculum is a great and noble thing that can do nothing but good. It certainly will not harm the education system. It will allow, through the release of the imagination, the, the intuitive spirit, <coughs> the, the confidence that kids have, it will, it will enhance learning in every other field. Well, idealistic. All this, yes, but uh, I call myself a pragmatic idealist, and I think this is pragmatically idealistic. It'll be difficult, and it'll be complex, and the pressures of our day-to-day, -day, uh, market-driven society are daunting. We all need to survive. We all have other pressures pushing in, but I think when people recognize what this can deliver, then we start to move toward this long-term vision of change. We can't settle anymore for, for fleeting opportunism. We've got to have our eyes on the, on the long target. Because if we don't, the, the challenges that I listed earlier on are all too real. I mean, the Millennium Development Goals, which talk about clean water and, and rights and so on, they're, they're, they were put together by, by the United Nations and they're wonderful ideals. But if we get even halfway there, by the time they're supposed to be achieved, which is 2015, we'll be fortunate. Uh, we have to bring our minds to a different mindset. We have to be ready to embrace change, and this is one of the most fundamental ones. Because without the imagination, um, then we've shortchanged <laughs> ourselves. We, we, we are, are shortchanging our economy. We have, a, as I say, an economy that's going to be based on, on imagination far more than on resources. If we don't have the ability to bring through a generation, two generations, three generations of people who can, who can apply their imaginations to these problems and to these opportunities, then we're lost. Now, the countries that, that 
that know that recognize this are already moving in that direction. Korea, 2004, um, Korea, the, the government of Korea recognized uh, that they'd spent 40 years becoming a great powerhouse economically in, in that region of the world. Uh, they'd become a tremendous economic force, but they lost touch with their creative identity. They didn't know who they were anymore uh, in terms of cultural background. And at the same time, the Korean government recognized this argument that we, if we don't engage, release the power of the imagination, then we're going to fall backward in terms of human progress because that's the way society is going globally. So 2004, they issued an edict that everyone, every school kid gets an arts education, compulsory. Every service person in the army gets an arts education, and every bureaucrat gets an arts education. Because very canny stuff. I mean, yes, it gives them back their sense of, of cultural identity, builds uh, national unity, but it also provides the groundwork for this new resource. The, probably the most important, precious resource for the future is the imagination. So yes, I think we can do this. I think it's, uh, it's, it's possible, it can be done. I think all that's necessary is the will. Just imagine. Thank you. <laughs>